Hey, Brittany, thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hey, Luann, how are you? I'm great. So I'm thinking about this conversation and you know, because you listened to the show and you did the intake form in order to be on the show. And you said, I asked everybody, you know, what do you suggest for your title? Not that I listen to you, by the way, all the time, but I do th- want to know what you think. <laughs> um, we have to make titles for SEO. You have to understand that. We can't make them for the pretty. But I like to hear the way your brains think and what you think the focus is. And you shared that, like, curating your design business, right? As a, like, there's a, there's a, what you do as a designer is curate the designs. But you've learned in your five and a half years in business that you need to curate the business part too. So talk to me, what does that mean to you? Why is that a choice, a turn of phrase that you chose to share with me? Absolutely. Um, Well, first, you know, thanks for having me on the show. You know, as I mentioned to you before, I'm a huge fan and I've been listening to you for the last four years. Um, and it's been such a crazy ride. Uh, you know, Luann, when I was in design school, um, you know, they obviously teach you the ins and outs of the technical drawings and the 3D renderings and all the things that you need to do in order to execute um, a design project. But to what it is to be a true entrepreneur and to be a business owner, you know, and I think as I listen through all your podcasts, it's just been so enlightening to listen to everyone's stories and, you know, from the size of their team to the types of projects that they work on and the types of vendors that they work with. And, and yeah, I think it's just as important being a business owner as it is to be a good designer and being able to run a successful interior design business. um, You have to have both. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that today. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, you guys, you know, we're cut from the same cloth here because I expect you to do the pretty, but it's very difficult to create a business that's sustainable, that will attract repeat and referral clients if you cannot deliver on the experience and on the process, right? At the end of it, everybody pretty much gets to a pretty room. But if getting to that pretty room or building or space or whatever it is was painful and complicated and felt like a, you know, chaotic journey, then that's, you're, that's not going to be a referable client, right? Absolutely. And I think too, is, you know, when we onboard a new client, you know, the types of projects that we work on, they take anywhere from a year to three years to complete. So you know, we're in a relationship with these clients for, you know, long periods of time and we become essentially an extension of their lifestyle. So if there's a lot of friction there, then it's not going to be a a successful experience and it's not going to be a successful project as beautiful as it can be. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that's something that I express to my team is, you know, we can make a room look beautiful in a hundred different ways, but how can we improve that process so that clients, you know, can speak about us from the standpoint of, you know, we love working with them. They were so much fun to work with. Um, And yes, our project and our home is absolutely stunning. Right, 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 right. Now, what's interesting is that, as we mentioned, five and a half years in business, you have already hired several of the professionals that you've learned about from the podcast. And I, you know, so Stacy Davidson does your accounting and does she work with you? Well, tell me the name of the, this is horrible that I can't remember the name of this is, but it's something behind the design, everything but the design. Yeah. Everything but the, <laughs> the, but the design. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah Stacy's amazing. Um, you know, I've been working with her for almost a year now and Stacy's my business advisor. We meet once a week and then, uh, Abby, who's part of her accounting department, um, her and I have a weekly meeting as well. She does all of our bookkeeping alongside Stacy, um, and you know, and they're helping develop now um, our staging division, which is super exciting. But they've definitely helped keep you know our process streamlined. Um, Stacy also does some HR work for us, and she really has become that sort of chameleon um, and has worn many hats for the business and has made everything great. So I'm really happy to have her. That's great. Yeah. I loved my interview with Stacy. We'll link it in the show notes here. I, I, I just, she impressed me and I don't think I realized that that was the depth of what she does. So you're meeting with her. She's almost feels like she's kind of functioning as like a director of ops for you or something. Like if you're meeting with her every week or a COO type of a thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we sit down for our weekly meetings, like she's always dropping, you know, some nugget there for me. And that, you know, that means the next day I'm coming in to the office and I'm like, girls, we're going to change the way we do this. And we're going to do this this way. And everyone's just so excited to always, you know, improve on our processes. And that's my main thing is I want everyone in the office to, um, you know, to do what they're doing um, at the optimal efficiency level, but then also, you know, that translates into the client experience. So it's been great. Yeah. And you've also hired a design partnership, Natalie Norcross's team. And so that's a PR firm. And what are you working like? That's, that's unusual that, that young in business to have the content for a PR firm to have, you know, so tell me about that experience. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. I actually hired Natalie, um, before I hired my first assistant. So she was, yeah, (laughs) I, you know, I was really fortunate early on, um, to have had the opportunities that I had. And then, you know, also just, um, at at the time I was working a couple different jobs. I was working two serving jobs. I had a, a real estate job and, um, you know, and then I was also going to design school and then starting my own business. So I had a lot going on at the time. And when I reached out to her, um, you know, through finding out about her through the podcast, I, I had content from projects that I was like, you know, I have these beautiful photos, I'm posting them on Instagram, but I know that, you know, there's so much more potential, um, for this content. So, you know, when I reached out to her, um, I just, I, identified early on that I was, you know, um, like I said, lucky enough to have these opportunities and I knew I had to capitalize on that. So Natalie has been with me for a while now and she's gotten us, you know, press, um, everywhere from architectural digest to the wall street journal to local wow. press. Wow. And it's, you know, I, I think that really, um, you know, early on boosted our credibility and people were really recognizing that we were working on big scale projects. And from far, you would think at the time I had this big team and then yes. I had this whole infrastructure and I didn't, it was really just myself. And, um, you know, my, the last project that I did on my own was a 10,000 square foot house. And once I got the photos back from that project, that's when I knew I needed, um, some help and, and that project ended up uh, being shortlisted on HGTV for Designer of the Year in 2022. Wow! So, so yeah, Natalie, funny enough, was one of my my first hires, essentially. Wow. Wow. So the thing about the reason that I brought this up and in addition to admiring these two women in their companies and wanting them to get a little bit of a shout out here. um, But the reason I brought it up is because, you know, it had to take a lot of guts to make these financial investments at this early stage in your business. And I think I want to know about that. I want to know about that mindset of saying, I'm going to do this. But I also want to know the practical of it. So for example, when you're telling me that you are hiring Natalie and you're still with two weight jobs, serving, serving jobs and a real estate job, you know, you're not even full time and you hire a PR firm. So there's guts in there. But are you did you fund that from the other businesses? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you just like, I'm investing in my business, whether it's profitable at this point or not? This is what I'm doing. Yeah, I definitely took a leap of faith. Um, You know, I've always uh, looked at my business and uh, scaled my business from a practicality standpoint. And, you know, I have these uh, I guess like I'm, you know, 50, 50, one side of me is very free spirited, very passionate about what I'm doing. And I'm just very creative. Right. And then the other side is the business side. So I'm like, okay, you know, how much is this really going to cost me at the end of the day? How long is this, you know, going to last? Like, what if, you know, I'm not profitable. What if I don't get more projects from this? Like, what if, you know, PR looks great and it sounds great and it feels great, but what if this doesn't bring, you know, the revenue that I'm expecting. Um, and, and I think, you know, and I liked how you said it took a lot of guts and it did. And, you know, to this day, a lot of what I do does. And yeah. um, I, I take risks, um, but I, I have faith in, in what we do. And I have faith in, in what um, I was doing on my own at the time. But uh, to answer your question, yes, I was funding the business from my other jobs yeah. um, until I could get, you know, these, um, you know, bigger jobs that were paying more. And, 
you know, obviously like every other designer, when I first started out, I wasn't charging what I'm charging now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I look back at what I was charging before and I just cringe because I'm like, (laughs) Oh my God, those like sleepless nights and all the time that I spent on site, you know, and, um, you know, charging these flat fees when I should have been charging hourly and that whole thing. Um, but but yeah, I, I really, I took the risk and, um, and it's really paid off and yeah. I have seen the return on that investment, um, tenfold because, you know, people will refer to my projects as like, Oh, the one that I saw on HGTV or, Oh, the one that, you know, that you guys posted on your Instagram that I was, that was on the cover of kitchen and bath. Wow. Um, so it's, it, it's really paid off. That's amazing. So set me back into that mindset because I believe that you have to invest in your business to grow it, right? Like what's so interesting is because I think many interior design professionals uh, hesitate or um, push back investing in their business in the beginning, whether that means investing in PR or professional development so that you get your, your, you have a business coach by your side, whether that means having somebody like Stacy, who's business and bookkeeping and so forth. Right. I think a lot of times why, um, design professionals resist this is because Typically, there is almost no expense to being in business. In other words, you can work out of your home. You can advertise on Instagram for free and, you know, with a simple cell phone and a couple of, you know, like a Canva account and my Doma Studio, you know, uh, software, you can yeah. run a project, right? But the thing is, when you think about the same interior designer, if they wanted to open up like a boutique clothing store, they would understand before I open my doors, I will have invested probably twenty five or thirty thousand dollars in inventory, probably thirty thousand dollars in outfitting the store with racks and beautiful changing rooms. And, you know, it's like crazy. And I think it sometimes is just because you can start with no financial investment. But the difference of the learning curve and the distance between like in this case press and no press is literally paying for the professional guidance and service of making it happen right yeah i I definitely i i agree with you on that and i think you know yeah it's easy to um to market it yourself from you know uh finding different ways to do it for free and and finding the easy way out but i just knew um going into this that i wanted to run a business and build a business that was legitimate and that felt legitimate. And I always, you know, I, I kind of like removed that sort of imposter syndrome from the very beginning. Um, you know, I, I was owning it. I was confident and I knew that all the hard work that I was putting, you know, I started out doing all the drawings myself, all the renderings myself, the 3d modeling, um, you know, down to the procurement. And I did, like I said, a ton of research and I found, uh, the platform that, you know, really helped organize all the project management stuff. And that was a uh, design spec and, you know, which I started out with design spec in the beginning, we still use it to this day. And so I felt confident in what I was, you know, uh, the service that I was providing to our clients and the value that I was bringing to the table. And so I really wanted to, um, I guess, boost the business up as much as I can and make it look and feel and run like a legitimate you know, a uh, business. I never singled myself out of like, I'm just this young designer starting out. How do I get to be, you know, uh, like Kelly Wurstler level? Like I always imagine myself, like I'm on her same playing field. You know? like, <laughs> Go girl. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have amazing clients. We have amazing projects. They're beautiful projects. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to run my business like that. And, you know, but there is a balance, right? Like there, cause I am a dreamer and I've always, you know, um, dreamt big very early on, but you know, I took it slow. Uh, I hired slow and I, um, you know, it, thankfully now I have just such an amazing group and, um, you know, that did come through a little bit of trial and error, uh, hiring people. Like I said, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't work at another interior design firm. I did an intern at another design firm. Wow. So I really, Um, I really just built this, uh, you know, based off of research and following my gut and what I really wanted it to be. Um, and so the people who, who weren't reflecting that, you know, thankfully early on kind of just almost removed themselves from the group and, 
And now, you know, like I said, I have solid systems in place um, that continue to evolve. Uh, and, and yeah, I think, I think everyone kind of takes a different approach in the beginning and you kind of just figure out what's right for you. But I, I did, I did come, come on with a very strong start. Yeah. So, and I intend to keep it that way. That's it. Know? I love it. I, I love it. It's not for everybody. So mm -hmm. I would love somebody else who goes slower and takes it slower, <laughs> I, but it's hard not to acknowledge the um, investment and the, and the confidence that you put behind yourself. My question on it is taking you, taking us back. I hear that you just, you just had a conscious decision. I'm, I'm not going to engage in imposter syndrome. I'm not going to allow that to really, maybe you had a moment here and there, but you're not going to live in it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. right? You're not going to live in it. What, what was external? support like? In other words, were there people, I don't know if it would be parents or siblings or partner who was just like, uh, wait, girl, like you're in business a minute, you're going to have a PR firm. Like, like the, not that that's the questionable thing, but any investment and any I'm making a business, sometimes that confidence that you're exhibiting and that you're recalling in yourself also sets other people back. And they're like, what are you doing? You're not big enough yet to do it. Did you have any of that? Or is everybody in your corner like, you got it, Brittany, we are on the Brittany train. So it's funny. I, um, I definitely had some people who were questioning the growth and who were questioning some of the business decisions that I was making. Um, one of my professors, uh, I'll never forget this. You know, I, it was my second job that I had and I was still in design school and he, you know, I was like, look, the schoolwork is like piling on. I, I'm literally coming to class. Like after leaving one of my jobs at like five in the morning, I'm showing up at eight in the morning. Like I'm a zombie at this point, but I was getting it done. And I asked him one day, I'm like, look, I have this project and it's a big project for a really, you know, um, big client who's very well known in Miami. And I need to submit these closet drawings to the contractor tomorrow. I'm like, I know this is an AutoCAD class and we're, you know, focusing on this case study project, but can I please <laughs> just, I'm like, can you please just let me draw can this Can I man's do my project in class and count it as homework? <laughs> yes, like, that's exactly what I asked him. And he looked at me and he was just like, I don't know, like, what makes you think you're so special? You're like here thinking you're going to run your own design business. And he kind of told me, he was like, you know, you you're you're too young you're too green you can't really do this right now you're not ready and i kind of was just like wow you know i left school that day and i was like i was just so discouraged Aww. not from running my business right from finishing school from so finishing like, school i'm like look I'm, try I'm here trying to do the right thing okay i'm trying to do the right thing on paper you're not letting me like we're gonna hit a wall so <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I, I had some people that, uh, you know, and, and also outside of school too, you know, I had, um, some of my, my mentors, um, you know, who I had met honestly, Luann through working in hospitality through, um, you know, uh, working in real estate. I had people who were like, you know, there's, I, I think you got to get a couple more projects under your belt. I think you got to do, you know, X, Y, Z first, and then maybe you'll be ready. Um, but then I also had a ton of people who were like, this is really special. Like mm -hmm. what you're doing right now is very special. And there's just not that many people that I know at your age who have these opportunities and who, you know, are willing to put in the hours and really like learn the trade mm -hmm. and, and do this. You know, I never outsourced one drawing. I never, you know, asked anyone for help. I was just like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this the right way. Um, you know, so I just, I listened to those people, you know, the people who I knew wanted the best for me and, um, you know, and on the marketing side, a lot of people were, were, um, you know, um, encouraging it. They were like, you, you got to get out there, yeah. you got to get out there. And, you know, I also had, um, you know, some of my very close friends also help me with that as well. You know, they had great connections in Miami. Miami is a place for networking, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you know, one person, they know the other, the next <laughs> thing you know, you're like in this big circle. So, you know, I was just fortunate enough to, um, you know, to meet all these people very early on and, um, 
and yeah, and I think, you know, that it's, it's just going to be like that. You know, you're going to have people, I think no matter what industry you're in, you're going to have people who are on the sidelines, like questioning, like what, you know, how are, how are you doing what you're doing and how are you getting there? And how do you know these people and asking all the questions and you just got to like, you know, ignore all that. Yeah. You know, the haters are going to hate at the end of the day. <laughs> so I, I, I just love it. I love, um, I love your belief in yourself. You know what I mean? It's, it's Thank the you. thing. It's a differentiator. You know, we can all get there eventually, but the sooner we believe in ourselves, and the sooner we understand that there's something in us worth believing because there is something in everyone, right? Like nobody has the market on you are, you are deserve this or you can do that. It's, it starts with us claiming it and saying, this is what I'm doing. I believe in myself. I'm going to invest in myself. I'm going to do all the good things, listening to free podcasts, but investing in professionals, <laughs> right? Like you didn't just like yep. buy everything. A lot of it learn by learning, right? Yeah. I just think it's outstanding. So here's my question. I'm almost afraid to ask. What's the five-year plan? <laughs> like world domination? Like, <laughs> do you see so, a path ahead of you or, and you don't need to, you don't need to have a five-year plan. You might be like, Hey, give me a minute to like figure this out and really do what I'm doing. But, or do you have a, a vision for where you want to be eventually? I do. Um, so, and, and it's funny cause I, I had a feeling you were going to ask this question. And, you know, <laughs> and so I was already thinking about it. I'm like, okay, so in five years from now, if I zoom out and I go five years back, did I think I was going to be here? Um, I don't know if I really had like a solid, you know, idea of like where I even wanted to be, Luann, if I'm being completely honest. I've always just been the, the kind of person that I have faith that, you know, I'll be happy as long as I'm enjoying the journey and I'm just working hard and, you know, um, spending time on, on things that I love doing. And, and I know that comes, you know, with a lot of challenges that, you know, I've had to, um, I've had to face over the last few years, but, you know, part of the reason why I think I love what I do so much is because it's just, problem solving all the time mm. and that's just like stimulating and it's just it's fun and it's exciting um but if i if i think about the next five years um you know right now the service that we offer to our clients is um it's full design service so meaning uh you know we'll take projects from the architectural planning phase to the design and schematics and then um we follow that up with the procurement so we're sourcing designing custom uh, working with great vendors, and then we're on site, you know, boots on the ground uh, with the GCs, and we're uh, managing construction and then furnishing and styling the job. So <clears throat> right now, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, is we're looking to open a staging division hmm. for the company. So in the last couple years, I noticed something that was, um, you know, really special, and that's that some of our clients have actually sold their properties um, for, you know, double and triple the amount of what they bought them for. And they sold them fully furnished. Yeah. Like when I say fully furnished, I'm talking about down to the candle, down to the book, the artwork, like the buyers just want everything. Yeah. And so I started thinking, I'm like, you know, it's, it's amazing how we're designing for our private clients, like, you know, these custom projects, um, but then it's speaking to a wider market mm. and, you know, Miami and with what's going on with real estate in Miami and how it's just, you know, ever evolving. And, um, you know, the, if I tell you, like, for example, the, the one house that I mentioned that I did as like, you know, my last project I did on my own, uh, 10,000 square foot home, our client bought it for 14 million. And then he sold it like six months after, uh, he moved in for $32 million, Whoa. you know, so we're talking big numbers. And so I think with staging, I've never seen a staging company that executes a project where you can't really tell if it's a project for an end user or if it's a uh, staging for real estate staging mm. for resale. And so I'd love to bring in that sort of custom approach to staging that I don't think has really been done before. Um, hmm. And that I think translates really well in Miami. And so that's sort of what I'm working on now. And I think, you know, down the line, we'll do a ton of staging um, and then still work on, on our, on our, you know, full service design projects, but more on a, like, you know, very exclusive level. Um, 
And, and yeah, I think that'll really book me for the next five years. Well, and it's funny because you need, I, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you, you know it, but staging is a different animal. It's a whole oh, different yeah. animal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's faster. It's all the things. And luxury staging is 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 crazy. I mean, we've had um, conversations on the show about staging. I remember in New York City, I met Cheryl Eisen. Um, are you familiar with her work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? She's, she's amazing. Oh my God. Right. And, and what, like, she's like, you know, I don't know, five foot nothing and, you know, minus 85 pounds, like, but like a powerhouse. <laughs> she's killing it. Yeah. Yeah. She's killing yeah. It. And then Taylor Spellman used to be uh, a stager as well. High end luxury stager. That's been on the show a couple of times. Um, the thing is that I, what I like that you talked about is that it's a division that you understand it's opening up another it's a, it's opening up another revenue stream but it's going to have a completely different process and it will need different people on that team not that they can't cross la but like when you mention you know your luxury design projects are 1 to 3 years so somebody's used to working on your team and that 1 to 3 thing and then all of a sudden they have 1 to 3 minutes to get a staging yeah. done you know <laughs> it's a different skill set sometimes in people to make that recognition that Oh yeah, we're not going to think about this for five hours. We're actually already going to have stuff sourced and on the mood board by then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I think both companies will sort of complement each other, you know, because like yeah. I said, the flair that I'll bring to luxury staging will be, you know, we'll have our own signature collection um, and we'll work with our vendors, our local vendors to, you know, make, um, you know, a line of, of beautiful custom headboards that can be modular or, you know, um, sofas and just sort of create this inventory that, you know, Hey, if we have, um, if we have a project where we have a sofa on back order for, you know, six to eight months, but we need a design project furnished and done. Well, guess what? Now we have, you know, our sister company that can sort of serve, uh, the other. And I think there's just, you know, I think the, the beauty of, um, custom design and custom furniture that's sort of what um moved me to name the company house of one and you know i love designing custom pieces i love collaborating um you know with different artisans and vendors and and working with them on you know making beautiful uh collages together because that's really what a design project is it's just a beautiful collage right um and so I think there's a lot of synergies between the two. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in a place like Miami where there are so many opportunities and, you know, with real estate, there's just so much going on and so much inventory. Like, you know, it, it's just, I see these um, listings on Zillow. Cause again, going back to research, I'm always on Zillow. I'm always, you know, trying to see what's going on out there. And I see these projects and I'm like, oh my God, you know, staged, and I'm like, this could be way better, you know, yes. let us come in and like really like sell the home for you. So I think that'll be fun and collaborating with different real estate agents and um, kind of bringing the whole team together, I think will be really cool. I love that. And, you know, in your you mentioned that you were in the real estate industry. Were you in luxury real estate at that point or were you in your garden variety? We all live in a regular house real estate. <laughs> no, funny enough, I was in commercial real estate. So oh, so it's completely different. Big boys. Yeah. yeah. I was like, you know, I was sitting in an office, you know, with, um, you know, a, a very um, well-known developer um, in Miami. And every Monday we'd have these 8 a.m. meetings. And I was just like, I would leave those meetings and be like, oh my God, you know, like that's when I had a little bit of imposter syndrome too. And I was just like, oh my goodness, like I just had a meeting, you know, with, with so-and-so and this is just like insane. And, you know, even having those conversations with clients, you know, like knowing what properties trade for per square foot and being able to connect with clients on, you know, a personal level, because a lot of our clients, you know, we work with CEOs, celebrities, athletes, people from all walks of life, but, um, you know, being well-rounded in the things that I'm passionate about has also, you know, gravitated us towards this community of people that we really enjoy to work with. Mm. So I think it's all really complimentary. I love it. Well, I love, you know, that's like you, when you cut your teeth in commercial real estate with the big property developers and stuff. I mean, that's great training for now having those conversations with these same types of 
people that are the clients of who you're working with now that, you know what I mean? So that's like, yeah. you know, like you said, there was a little imposter syndrome at that point because you were that much younger, but you know, you've, you've dealt with those people. We're not intimidated by them now. We're like sitting across yeah. the table and you're like, come on, like, let's just do the deal. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Now I see them at events. Like, we have seen you blow up. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just there like, yes, I will be calling you in about six months when we have our inventory. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I meant to ask you, go back to that explanation of the name of the company, House of One. When I was reading about you before it, I meant to ask you that question. I didn't get it right there. What were, is it the House of One is one? T- t- what, what's that? What's that mean? Yeah. So House of One, um, you know, it's, it's really, it, it's about creating spaces and experiences for clients that are unique and that are special. Um, and in that we, like I said, we do a lot of custom furniture. Um, you know, clients come to us because, um, they want to hire a designer that's going to make really cool moments. You know, they want something really fun that they can be proud of and, you know, um, share with their friends and their family and have cocktail parties and come over. And then their friends are like, Oh my God, what is that piece? And they're like, Oh yeah, it's my piece. And I only have it, you know, and that's kind of the really cool bespoke moments, um, you know, that, that we really love to do and and to create. And I knew very early on, I was not going to be the designer and I'm not, you know, talking down on any designer that does like living room designs or bedroom designs or, you know, sticks to one aesthetic. But I knew that I I wanted to be a little bit more broader than that. And I wanted to design, um, you know, uh, projects that were just, I I think, a lot more layered and a lot more complex. Mm, Interesting. I love it. Very cool. Very cool. So you look, we've heard a lot of the good stuff. We've had a lot of that. Tell me, you know, like a come to Jesus lesson, something that, cause you know, here's why, Brittany, here's why. Think about yourself listening to this podcast four years ago. You are one year in business and you hear Brittany and Brittany has got it together. She like has her confidence rolled up. She went out and hired a business, you know, manager. She hired a a design PR firm, you know, and somebody listening could be like, well, oh, and she, she talked her professor down. You know what I mean? By the way, (laughs) did he let you do that? The closets for that project? He didn't. Ah. I'm not going to say whether or not I failed or passed the class, but <laughs> yeah, he did not let me do that. You see, that's just like, come on, dude, be in the real world for a minute. Like, I got to yeah. say, I just feel like, I don't know, I shouldn't talk out of turn. I've never taught a design class. I've never taught any darn class, you know, at that level. So maybe I wouldn't have either, but it just feels like to me, what's the difference, right? Like, what's And the by difference? the way, and you know, by the way, I felt like I wasn't feeling bad about, um, you know, working on projects outside of school, but I was being very, um, discreet about it. I wasn't telling all my friends like, yeah, "Yeah, I got this project. You know, I didn't want to make anyone feel like they weren't doing enough or that they should already be working, you know, on projects outside of the classroom. Like I knew that I, you know, was kind of dealing with something that, and by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. You know, I, right. I, I took, I'm, I took a road that was very, very <laughs> difficult, but, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, if, if I was him, you know, going back, I would have just let, you know, yeah. let the student that's trying to, you know, dream big and do what they got to do. Like, just let them do it. But yeah, I, I mean, know. I don't, like I said, you know, there's going to be some professor out there that's going to straighten me out. You can take that to the bank and that's fine because I don't really know what I'm talking about. What I just mean <laughs> to say is, I don't think I would have allowed you to substitute the project for the entire semester because maybe there's principles yeah. within the things that I was assigning you that I need to know that you master that may or may not have been involved in the closets. But I'm talking about that day. Like if you got to show yeah. up that day and do something in CAD, can it be this? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. So, but here's the thing I was, where I was going was, go back four and a half years ago and you hear this and you listen, somebody is young like you are and they have just seen, everything just seems to fit into place. And we know that it's been hard. We don't want somebody to feel intimidated. We don't want them to feel like, you know, it was easy for you. So is there a moment or a lesson or an aha that it occurs to you? Oh no. Hey, let me tell you or share this aspect with you. Yeah. I think, um, you know, 
it's really important to have positive people around you. This is not an easy road and it can feel really lonely. You know, entrepreneurship can feel really lonely at times, um, you know, and, and it's important to, like I said, have people around you who are successful, even in their own industry. They don't need to be people who are directly involved in the design industry, but having people that you can just talk to and say, hey, you know, like I'm feeling a little down today. Like I'm feeling stressed out. I don't really know what to do. Um, you know, I, there's things that I don't know that I can't even do research on, you know, like, where do I turn to? Um, and, and I think the number one thing, you know, I, I have a, a, a friend of mine who, you know, she's starting her own business and now I've sort of become her mentor, Aww. which has been, you know, really nice. And, you know, she told me, she's like, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that we've been able to sit down and have these talks. And, um, you know, I've told her kind of more in depth of, of my story kind of, uh, you know, coming into this, but, you know, get your finances in order. There's no, there's no, um, you know, there, there's not a time that's too early to really, you know, uh, get the CPA and get QuickBooks and start, you know, even if you're sending out an invoice and it's a, a you know, an invoice for a thousand dollars or, you know, oh, here's another big one. Don't ever, and I did this, Luann, but don't ever purchase um, any furnishings with anyone's credit cards. Clients in the beginning were very adamant about, oh, just use my Amex. I trust you with my Amex. No worries. Here, go ahead. And, you know, I did that for like maybe six months and it just became a complete headache. Um, you know, don't ever uh, take anyone's, uh, you know, uh, credit cards and things like that. Always purchase everything through you. If they want to purchase things on their own and your business model starting up is not to, um, you know, purchase any furnishings with markup, then sure. But, um, you know, I, I would say don't do that. And Tell me thing, what was the bad thing that happened by doing that? Because somebody just hearing it needs to hear the reason why. Uh, so you really don't want to have anyone's confidential information on any of your devices. You just don't want to have it on your phone. You don't want to have it on your iPad, on your computer. iCloud is a scary place, you know? And thankfully I didn't, you know, I, I didn't get to feel the bad end of that. But I think just, you know, polishing everything up and acting as if you have a team, even when it's just you, yeah. will only prepare you for success, you yeah. know? Like, it, it's it's going to be the best way to go. Um, the other thing I think that really changed my business was um, in the beginning, you know, I was never, I was never charging markup mm -hmm. and I was, you know, basically selling my clients. If it wasn't at retail, I was just handing them my discount. Oh. I didn't know any better. Oh. It's like, Hey, here's access to me and to <laughs> everything that I have. You want to take my house? You want to take my apartment? Take my car. Oh my um, gosh. You know, and that changed the business for me because I mean, at the time I was on my own. So thankfully the expenses weren't, you know, weren't that much, but now it's just like, Hey, you well, know, it's your profit having, center. It's your profit yeah. center. And who taught you center. that? Stacy or listening to the different shows and you just started to say, okay, I got to do this. Like, how did that, how did you make that change from, all right, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to charge markup. Uh, so I actually spoke with a designer. Um, this was like maybe four years ago now. And, and she was like, you know, how are you charging? Yeah. And I told her, oh, I'm just charging a flat fee. She's like, okay. And then, and then I'm like, and then I'm doing the project and she's like, okay, <laughs> but that, what do you mean? And, you know, I think it was like the very next day I had to send a proposal out and I just changed the structure. I just added a little, oh, by the way, there's going to be, you know, an X percent markup and they signed. Yeah. And then I got that, you know, uh, uh, I, I got that revenue in and I was like, wait. What wait, did I wait, leave on I'm the like, table all this time? I'm like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> if I really, I'm like, if I look back and think about how much money I didn't make, I'm going to oh. be in a really bad mood. So right, I'm going to be in a puddle of mud. <laughs> yeah, let me be in a good mood and think about how much money now I can actually make, which just goes to show you, like, and this is one thing I'll say, do not go into this business because you want to make money. That's like, you know, <laughs> go into this business because you love it. And in this business, you can make a ton of money. Right. I think that's sort of, you know, the way to look at things because, um, you know, I, I just heard one too many stories about, uh, you know, unfortunately, interior designers not using best practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
the way I think about it is like, if you tarnish your reputation with one client, consider it tarnished for life. Mm -hmm. Like it, that's it. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I think the finances, um, and keeping everything, you know, just as tidied up as possible early on and just kind of, you know, acting as if you have a full team from the beginning is, is only going to do, uh, great things for you in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I think it's outstanding. You know, it's funny because, um, I think I've said this on the show before. I've never met an interior designer that became an interior designer by accident. Never met one. Never met one. Never. I've interviewed a, a thousand designers. I've met another 2000 designers at events over the last eight years and how many over the 40 years in business at window works. And I've never had anybody say to me, well, you know, I, you know, my mother, sister, brother, Susan, you know, was doing it and I figured I'd do it too. Or I started working at a design firm. And the next thing you know, I was a designer. Like every one of you comes to it with a passion, right? Like I promise you, I sold window treatments for 40 years because I was dating Vinny and he had a window treatment business. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> like I was like, are we selling something here? Put it in front of me. I'll sell it. If he sold copiers, we'd have an amazing copy business. I can promise you that. I could give a rat's butt. What was he at the end of it? I like to sell. I like to be, you know, and, and like you said, I like to problem solve. I like to get in the thick of it. Right. But I've never met a designer that's like by accident, I'm a designer. And so your point is to me, the nuance of your point is well-made. It's like, get into it because you love it, but then figure out a way to make it profitable so that you can keep doing what you love. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, it's kind of like, like being a doctor. Like, are you a doctor by accident? Like, I don't know. It's kind of like really hard to do. And that's the same thing with being an interior designer. It's so hard to do that you just don't like, well, I'll just do this as well as anything else. It's just too hard. And I do think you need to have that passion attached to it. But you know, it's my mission that everybody attaches profit to it so that they can do it for as many years as they choose to do it. They don't just say, oh, I'd love to do it, but I can't do it anymore because I can't make a living at it, you know? Yeah. Especially when you have a team, you know, I'm yeah. not just worried about, you know, the money that's going in my pocket. I'm worried about, you know, my team and their future and, you know, their goals. Yeah. And I have quarterly meetings with them and I sit down and I'm like, you know, are you happy? Are you doing what you like to do? Uh, you know, what, how can we sort of shift you? Do you want to focus on designing custom furniture? Do you want to focus on how can we make you, you know, work more efficiently, be happy so that the end result for our clients and for the projects are, you know, at a hundred percent. So then that means that, you know, we're going to be profitable. Everyone's going to be happy and that it's, you know, it, it's all going to work out for everyone. So, and by the way, you know, managing a team, that's, I, I think, you know, you asked me about if I was four years ago listening to this podcast, um, I think one of the things that I, I really didn't prepare myself for was managing a team. Mm. And that, you know, <clears throat> think about when you're growing up and you're in school and you have your group of friends, you get to pick your group of friends. And if you don't like someone, great. Okay, fine. That, <laughs> you know, you find your own little group of friends. When you own a business and you have a group, you know, of different personalities, you can't just fire one because you don't like their personality. <laughs> you got to go through all these layers and all these, you know, like steps in order to figure out like, you know, what's really going on and, and, you know, how can you help people sort of be the best version of themselves that they can be? And if they don't want that for themselves or they don't see that for themselves with you, then that's okay. You know, but I think, um, you know, figuring out how to manage, uh, a team is, is also really important to think about if you want to hire, you know, right. cause there's people who there's designers who do very well with outsourcing and they're just doing it on their own. And maybe they're not taking on 15 projects at a time. You know, they only want to do maybe two or three and they're doing great. Well, I love it. And the thing about it is, is, you know, you're, you're right. It's no joke managing a team and hiring and all of the things. Um, but it starts with understanding yourself well enough to know your strengths and your gaps so that you hire around those, you know, for your gaps and 
things like that. And then also having your mission and your vision for your company so that you're hiring within that mission and the culture of your company. And that's like that next level of um, informed hiring and of um, becoming more of a conscious hirer and not hiring just for the skill set in front of you, but really understanding that you're hiring the human, the culture, and it, how it fits, how that person fits with the rest of you. So um, it is the, it is, it is a real challenge for every business owner to honor both their own personal, you know, values and the mission of their company, and then find the unicorn that can do the skill, but also fits those things. But that that's possible to do, and it's also hard work. So, and then you have to put in the effort to manage and maintain them. So. You know, yeah, it's all a thing. It's all, all a thing. It's all the things yeah. are things. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, it's all, it's all fun. It's all fun. That's and it. like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's been great. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to see where things go and, and to continue to grow. And, you know, right now we're, we're traveling um, a ton. You know, we, we've been able to, over the last year and a half, go to places like, you know, uh, Colombia and Italy and um, Malibu and wow. it's just it's amazing it's like it, I'm like <laughs> I'm living a dream right now you oh know and so gosh. I'm you know I'm happy and everyone's happy and you know there's obviously little nuances here and there and we continue to you know to try our best to elevate um but but yeah, it's good for you. Good for you, kiddo. Working I swear to God, that's awesome. I, I, you know what? I don't know how many years I'm going to do this darn podcast, but if I'm still here in 10 years, I want to interview with you again in 10 years. I want to see what the <laughs> heck you did because this is like going to be a rocket ship ride. <laughs> so that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the show for all these years. I appreciate that. And thank you for wanting to share your story on the show and helping, you know, the, the ones that are behind you understand that, you know, it can be done. We have to make some hard decisions. We have to have belief in ourselves, but it can be done. And I appreciate you for showing up, Brittany, and sharing it today. Thanks, Luann. I appreciate you and your platform. And, you know, I hope that anyone who listens to this episode or any other episode just, you know, understand that you have a real gem right here and you've been able to help me and so many other people. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you.